Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jan De Silva, President and CEO of the Toronto Region Board of Trade. It's so great to be back at the Toronto Global Forum, an event the board has been a proud partner of since 2017. And while I only wish we could be meeting again in person, uh, COVID measures clearly prevent us from doing so. That doesn't mean that we can't continue to share information and foster connections globally and online. In fact, the pandemic gives us an even greater incentive to do so. The theme of this year's forum, Forging a Resilient Economy, is in fact both a question and a call to action. What are the ways to design more durable, inclusive, and prosperous global economies, even as travel and supply chains are disrupted? And how can we, as international business and civic leaders, put those designs into action? Joining me now is someone who's thought a lot about doing just that, the President and CEO of Western Union, Hikmet Ersik. With a 20-year career at Western Union and rising to the helm of Western Union a decade ago, Hikmet has successfully diversified the company, transforming it into a technological pace setter. With over 100,000 ATMs and kiosks around the world, they're an international brand, employing people in more than 100 countries. And with millions of online bank accounts and mobile wallets, they're leading an inclusive innovation mandate critical in a rapidly transforming global payments marketplace. Welcome, Hikmet. How are you? I'm fine. How are you, Jen? Thank you for having me here. Very much appreciate you taking the time to be with our forum audience. Because this is an international crowd and you have a unique global vantage point, I'd like to start our conversation there. At the start of the pandemic, the economic shock of closing businesses and assembly lines was near universal. The World Bank forecasted the global economy to shrink by more than 5%. And in April, the New York Times ran a headline that warned the end of the world economy as we know it, accusing globalization of causing a compound effect on the recession we're experiencing now. With countries keeping borders closed, and reshoring some of their supply chains. I'm curious, do you think this is indeed the end of a globalized economy as we know it? And if not, why? <laughs> I think um, it's not the end of the globalization, obviously the issues and uh, you know, especially during COVID-19, what we are seeing, um, it brings us actually together as a global, uh, global society because it's you know one country alone can't solve the COVID-19 issues obviously right and closing the border is a, maybe a short-term uh, short-term act but not a solution and it's a long term I you know I believe that the globalization as we know will be renamed in a new globalization mm -hmm. and I think the globalization is not on it's not the privilege about the um, big governments and um, big corporations anymore, it will be owned by the individuals. Let me give you some examples. Um, you know, today there are about 8 billion people worldwide. Most of the people worldwide do have a mobile phone. They are connected worldwide. They are connected uh, with their loved ones. There are about 275 million people worldwide. They were not born in their own country. They were born somewhere else. These 285 million people are connected to 800 million people worldwide, where they call their second home. They are called them double belongers. And I can see in our business that the globalization continues here. They are supporting during COVID-19 also. They are supporting their loved ones, the 800 million people, by sending money. Uh, there, are about, there is about 700 billion um, dollars moving every year from one country to, one, you know, to different countries and supporting their loved ones. Despite the political environment, um, you know, calls for protectionism, countries like, especially in developed countries like USA or Canada or UK or parts of European Union are closing borders. And um, despite the, um, you know, the foreign aids are getting cut, the foreign investments are getting more cut, the individuals are supporting their loved ones. It's year over year, the uh, remittances are increasing. I mean, a few years ago, it was about $500 billion. Now it's already $700 billion and increasing. And it's going directly to the, to the hands of the people. They really need it. They create jobs there. And that's a big factor of globalization. The second thing is also, Jan, you know, the problems are global problems. The problems we uh, 
hunt, uh, await them by building walls, building borders. COVID-19 is an example. Uh, global warming is an example. Migration is an example. You know, closing the borders for a few years doesn't uh, prevent that there will be a migration because of global warming. So we have to work together to solve this issue. And the businesses like us are big, you know, big, um, big speakers for the building bridges between economists. And we have to understand that. And that's a huge um, step forward. Without that, I think the world would be in a worse, uh, uh, worse, worse position. So summarizing it, um, the globalization will come to you in a different form. It's going to be owned more than by 8 billion people, and it's not going to be a privilege of uh, certain countries. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I certainly agree. The benefits of a connected global economies, they must endure, uh, even though we've got some temporary cracks in the system caused by COVID. I mean, if we just look at a business region like Toronto, uh, we're continuing to produce and commercialize services and products, and we simply just don't have a large enough domestic consumer market to scale those operations. So global markets are critical to us, just as they are uh, for a lot of the emerging markets. I mean, globalization has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. So um, it really is critical for the, for the world economy. Um, it's also something we've been working at at the board trying to address through interprovincial trade advocacy. What's interesting is, I, I don't know how familiar you are with the Canadian context, but in fact, it's easier for many of our local firms to do business globally than it is within Canada because we've got legacy artificial uh, interprovincial trade barriers. So that's the subject for another day. COVID has nothing to do with it. It's uh, a lot of political advocacy that we're taking on at the moment. Can you speak to nationalism's impact on business and innovation? And what are the advocates for insular economies not seeing? Well, um, from the from business as a business leader, I think you know, we have to differentiate between politicians and business leaders. How we see nationalism. There, uh, today's world, in, in what I see as a business leader, is that there is a big mix between uh, being a patriot and nationalist, and that put put in the same um, same uh, same cup and that's that's wrong i think i guess uh, jan you know many canadians are the patriots but at the same time they are welcoming many nationals to their countries and they work with them together i think that's the right approach and the short-term thinking of nationalism is not good it's uh, it creates barriers it creates um it creates us against them instead of we together, that won't solve issues. It's really short term looking at that. But we also have to respect the people's thinking, what they are struggling with. And these problems can't be also just say that, uh, you know, we don't ignore the national interests of a country and that's, that's, um, that's not good. So global leaders and global um, politicians have to think how they build the bridges between uh, being, um, being patriot at the same time building this uh, welcoming environment to solve the global issues. The nationalism uh, headlines definitely doesn't help uh, businesses like Western Union, businesses like global businesses, but also not, I, I'm sure not also Toronto region doesn't help for that because, you know, if you think about you want to make an event, you want to invite uh, people from all over the world, you've been a center of uh, creating wealth, um, nationalist environment doesn't allow that. That headlines does do uh, create fears. That headlines does uh, do create uh, an anti-inviting environment. It's us and nobody else and them. And that's not good for long term for the world. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously COVID-19 or some economical issues are short term issues. I really believe on that. But long term, uh, we have to always uh, look at that. We have one planet. And we have one uh, issue, uh, you know, we have one place to live, it's the planet, and that's, that's the prosperity of the planet is important. Yeah. Well, you're emphasizing the idea that collaboration is key to unlocking innovation, to unlocking uh, growth. You touch lightly on some of the challenges our world is facing. Could you maybe give us some more examples? What, in your opinion, is going to really require a coordinated global approach to solve? I think um, there are several issues, as I said, you know, COVID-19 is the hottest issue currently, but and, uh, as I mentioned also, so climate change is another issue, but also things like uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning, right? 
while we all are fan of machine learning, artificial intelligence, really securing the data of the privacy, of course, of everyone, at the same time, really advancing our technologies. And that's what we want to invest. That's as business leaders, but we really look forward to understand the customer needs better with the artificial intelligence. At the same time, artificial intelligence has a risk also. Uh, you know, there, there are statistics saying that um, about 500 to 800 million jobs worldwide in 2023 could be lost because of artificial intelligence, because of machine learning. So how do you re-educate these people? How do you uh, overcome this um, an issue which may be an advantage, but at the same time issue needs a global corporate uh, cooperation. Cooperation uh, uh, Corporates like us do think about that. How we you know, overcome this issue at the same time being efficient, but also creating jobs. And we at West Union, I can, we, you know, I, I'm very proud that during COVID-19, uh, we really, the first thing was what we have done, protecting our people and uh, keeping their jobs. And we mm -hmm. said, okay, safety and job creation is important because we know that the job, uh, you know, getting a seller means that also sending your kid to a school, yeah. getting a it means also paying your mortgage or school fee. So that's important. But at the same time, uh, you know, as business leaders, we do look at our um, profitability. And that balance needs global cooperation. That yeah. balance needs learning from, is it from Vietnam? Is it from Finland? Is it from Uganda or Peru or Canada? And that's that uh, openness uh, of uh, global politicians and not closing only the borders and, uh, you know, uh, not saying that I don't care. It's not good that we need that uh, thing. It's one example, as I said, how do we overcome the advantages of artificial intelligence, also disadvantages of artificial intelligence, machine learning. Well, I would say certainly what we're seeing uh, in different parts of the world right now, technology has been a huge solution uh, for things like contact tracing and uh, other types of mitigation just to help. Um, I know we've long been advocating not just for trade agreements, but also for harmonizing operating and regulatory environments so we can use technology uh, to benefit our economies, to benefit our citizens. Um, I wanted to um, narrow in on the topic of digitization. Uh, digital tools are the ultimate enablers of borderless business growth, as you would very well know at Western Union. Um, here at the Board of Trade in Toronto, we just completed our first virtual trade mission to China. We've got similar missions going to the Netherlands and Spain in the coming weeks. And we've only been able to do this because of the digital tools at our disposal. And we've launched a new program that's helping businesses integrate those tools into their front, middle, and back offices. In your view, how is the digital revolution changing the global economy? And what do governments and businesses need to be aware of? First of all, congratulations to you with your China mission. That's fantastic. I mean, not many. We were fast. I have to say that you were very fast. You were innovative. You find a solution. The crisis, uh, every crisis creates also, uh, creates also an opportunity. I believe the digitalization change the world don't last 90 days speed up, uh, overcame the next 10 years, what happened at the digitalization. Um, uh, I believe in 90 days, we overcome all the 10, day, 10 years of, uh, um, you know, uh, the obstacles or the speed bumps we have on the way. Uh, the crisis created that. And companies like West Union was ready. Uh, they, we were ready to respond to that. I mean, you know, the companies who ignoring that digitalization have a difficult time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could see not only in the companies like West Union, also in SMEs, small companies. Uh, to, in today's world, uh, phone, um, smartphone is your basically your communication, your translator, your accounting, your uh, payment instrument, your everything, right? And that's the that that's a huge opportunity for many SMEs also, and that and we have to talk about that. You can be connected with Indonesian furniture exporter immediately uh, from Canada, Toronto, and exchange in daily and and the cloud translates that. Uh, translates that to your local needs and mm -hmm. you create a job in Toronto with that. So this is a huge advantage. We at West Union, uh, I give you an example. Before COVID, pre-COVID, it was about 15% of our transaction was um, digital. Uh, and now after uh, digital initiated means by a phone or by a computer, yeah. 
that people don't go to a location. And now it's about 30%. That's 90 days. And that, uh, that fast turnaround is one example of many examples. And we change, adapt our business model at the same time. At the same time, though, digitalization and having a mobile phone is not the answer. You have to understand different, different economical environments. Um, in Canada and Toronto, having a digital solution doesn't mean that it will also apply to Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to connecting the people in a different uh, needs uh, with different um, uh, way is important. The people in Bangladesh have mobile phones. The people in Bangladesh do connect. That. At the same time, the needs there, the economic environment is different than in Toronto. Building that bridge, it has been always a strength of Western Union, understanding in 200 countries, the different dynamics of millions of customers and 134 currency has been a big, uh, big advantage. So companies like that, I encourage also companies who are in your circle in Toronto, advice to really understanding the customer needs in different environment and forcing the digitalization and pushing the digitalization with that environment is I believe a good business model. Well, and it's interesting because we've actually had a program that we've started since COVID uh, uh, emerged. It's called the Recovery Activation Program, and it's targeting small and medium-sized businesses and helping them build a digital transformation blueprint because pre-COVID, many of them just didn't focus on this, didn't worry about it, but with the conditions of COVID, it's critical. Front, middle, back office, you need to be digitally uh, fluent to be able to continue operating, let alone, as you say, connect to these global markets and global opportunities. You know, as, as, it, as it pertains to technology, what themes are you noticing emerge, especially for the business community? Yeah, I think that uh, the big... Uh, themes are obviously the biggest the data and technology is a big uh, subject that companies uh, with like us as a uh, as a, have to um, deal with the transform the transform the transformation the information is a big thing right you know um, the question I have for the industries and for the economists is that Today, I believe the statistics is that 50% of the future economies will be transformation of services, information transformation. So what the, what's going to happen with the capital intense economies? And we can't ignore that issue, right? It means that uh, the cap building a factor or build, you know, owning planes or owning factories or you know really capital uh, capital intense industries do struggle these days and how do we help them how do we you know how the governments help them with uh, economical environment with taxes that they're going to create uh, jobs continue to create jobs we can't ignore that saying that the future is only the service oriented on the digital right if the world is not work doesn't work like that yeah. So having an ear, having an understanding of that part of the sector, it's a very important one. They, they, some call it real economy. I call it a part of the economy with capital intense, right? I think that these are, you know, these are heroes. They are heroes. Like, you know, you build a hospital, it's capital intense. You build an airport, it's capital intense. You have air, airport, it's capital intense. And by the way, uh, it's very much linked to the globalization. Uh, you know, with COVID-19, we looked at our statistic at West Union at COVID-19. And, you know, in a hospital or in the first responders, right? Uh, you know, the general driver or whatever, um, the six, uh, 65% of the customer, uh, of the people who were our first responders are migrant background. And they've been, you know, they, they are heroes. If you go to, uh, go to a hospital in, in Canada, maybe you meet a Filipino uh, nurse, right? Yeah nurse from Africa, which supports the people not only in Canada, but also supports the people back home. That's an important, important thing to think about that, how we combine the new wave of economy with the existing needs, existing capital intense uh, environment. So that's something that's a challenge that we, over, we business leaders and the politicians have to overcome and people in general have to overcome that. Well, you know, I, I think um, Techstars and Western Union Accelerator, really, really exciting uh, initiative. You're working with startups. It, uh, there's a compelling mandate to shape the future of how money moves. So what do you see as that future and how does Western Union fit into that? 
Well, obviously, Western Union and Techstars uh, combination has been a great, uh, great combination because we learned a lot from the young stars. <laughs> there, you know, I've been in the payment industry over 35 years, and if you go there, I'm still learning from new environment, from really thinking differently. Because, um, you know, given the innovation, innovative way of how they how they really um, change the environment and how we can change Western Union is huge. Uh, future of the uh, of the payments industry, obviously, Western Union is very well connected because it's in. It built breaches between currencies, 131 currencies, right? I think uh, it's not easy. The world is more regulated. The world is getting more, um, you know, um, overseen from the local regulations. And how do you build this bridge? How do you overcome that? And how do you really find the niche? It's something that West Union has done a good job on that. I believe also the, uh, the payments industry in the local currency it means that Canadian dollar to Canadian dollar, US dollar to US dollar, pesos to pesos, will be get, getting more efficient, um, easier to do, and uh, will be also, uh, I think, for the consumer, uh, very efficient fees will be generated. However, when it comes to cross currents, across border transfers, it gets complex. With the complexity, obviously, we, we have to find solutions and which are more effective for the consumers and makes for the small businesses, your customers, uh, easier to receive or send money so they can create jobs and cash flows to prosper their businesses. Well, unfortunately, I'm, I'm getting the signal that I have to wrap up, Hikmet. I really uh, enjoyed the conversation. I have to say I'm, I'm always struck by your contribution to global prosperity, the connective tissue that Western Union provides between um, workers and families around the world, and the fact that um, that you are so digital and so uh, forward-looking really um, means a lot for the future of that prosperity for those families. So I just want to say thank you very much for joining us. A very interesting discussion today, and congratulations to you and your team at Western Union for the valuable work that you're doing on behalf of citizens around the world. I, I want to thank as well the International Economic Forum of the Americas for welcoming back um, and for having the Toronto Region Board of Trade as a continued partner. For those interested in some of the board's activities I spoke about today, such as our virtual trade missions or recovery activation program, visit supportbusiness.bot.com or reach out to us. And as Hikmet has said today, and as I fully agree, collaboration is key. And we're here for businesses in the region and to connect them around the world. Until then, enjoy the next session and have a great Toronto Global Forum. Thank you.